those really Chinese inventions, four of them? Uh, I don't think so. If you are, <laughs> <laughs> if you use a scale, did we invite the wrong guests? <laughs> no, go ahead. And I think uh, they're not a truly uh, the China's invention. If mm. you use a scale, so not a zero to one. But it's more than one to ten. I think it's uh, maybe one to one hundred. Explain, please. I think the significance is though all those um, uh, innovation has been very popular, and the scale is amazing, and also the the widely used and in in China's population. So that's number one significance. Uh, I think number two is the impact to the the other and uh, traditional and industry or techniques is quite a, a phenomenal. So those I think is quite unprecedented. I mm. think in China, Mr. Clark. Yes, I think we often confuse innovation mm. with invention. Mm -hmm. I mean, invention is part of innovation, but innovation can be smaller things, micro innovations, combining business models in new ways, but they can be equally impactful. And I think uh, Jay is right, the scale is everything. I mean, China is a laboratory that the world is looking at now, particularly big data or the scale of the, well, the, the rail infrastructure, mm -hmm. the online shopping, the mobile uh, and internet penetration here. I mean, I think China's internet population is bigger than the European mm -hmm. Union population. So, cool. so scale is a, is a gating factor. But yes, they, they, they came from other places and are combined here in new ways. Mm. Have those inventions, let's just say, even some coming back from the 1960s, let's just say shared bicycle system, right, in the Netherlands and elsewhere in Europe, have taken on a new pair of wings when they are being used and innovated here in China? Professor Wolf. Yeah, I mean, we, we see that partly because the, the sort of evolutionary parameters and the speed of evolution is simply different inside China. It's larger, it's more dynamic, it's more rapid growth, and it's probably the largest rural to urban migration and the largest development of a middle class by total population as well as almost by population percentage that we've ever seen. Mm. So whatever is coming in to China, to what extent that comes from outside, becomes something else when China re-exports it to the world and then it can be sort of a new product that takes the world by storm. So even if mobile payments weren't first done cell phone to cell phone inside the inside the Chinese market, what Alibaba pushed out or what Alipay pushes out, what's coming mm. out of uh, Tencent with the red envelopes or what's coming out of Baidu <laughs> is sweeping the world and is new uh, when it comes back to the market. I can tell Professor Wolf must have received a lot of red envelopes <laughs> through his uh, WeChat system over there. But <laughs> let me ask you about this, uh, Mr. Clark. One of the things is, what does this mean, not only for China, but also for the rest of the world, particularly emerging and also developing economies? China has managed to do this leapfrog, as they say. You know, China lost over in the second industrial revolution, but certainly in the fourth industrial revolution, as some have argued, taking the lead in a way. So many wonder, has the style of industrialization changed? Uh, do these days population matter? Do these days innovation matter rather than invention? What would you say, Mr. Clark? Yeah, I think connected populations matter increasingly. I mean, if we look at the emerging markets, how China is, uh, is playing a role also in uh, building out the infrastructure of companies like Huawei and others. We, you know, Jay was working at Intel before. Mm -hmm. you know, there was a big revolution in China in the 90s in informatization, you know, building the telecoms infrastructure, which then led to the internet, which led to the mobile. This is now bearing fruits, and a lot of emerging markets are looking at how China's done it, and they'll do it in different ways. But now these Chinese content providers and e-commerce providers are able to sort of lift up, if you will, in Southeast Asia and Africa right. and elsewhere, alongside with American uh, and other uh, contributors. But we have Silicon Valley, and we have Silicon Valley in China. I would say also China and Asia, because it's also Japan, Korea, but China's the real pusher mm -hmm. of this a promoter of this new Silicon Valley, frankly, in Asia. You could tell that because you wrote a book about Alibaba. You know, both Alibaba and Tencent now believe to be some of the strongest tech companies here in China. What did they say about this leapfrog process that they have taken up? And also, you think about Alibaba, for example. <coughs> Even in China's rural area, there's Sun Tao, you know, very small microcredit system for the rural villagers. villages. Yes, exactly. Yes. And if you look at Tencent, they are doing very similar things as well. Any corner 
of China. So what would this mean? Can this model be used elsewhere in the world, Mr. Carr? Well, we have to have the infrastructure. So we have to have the telecom infrastructure. We've seen this in Africa. It's not just in China. We've seen in, in Pesa in East Africa, for example, in payments, people leapfrog. People don't have bank accounts. They don't need them anymore. Um, and so you know, China in some areas is behind and some areas ahead. But overall, it's about this belief in infrastructure and in technology, which is really top down in China, mm. but also very much bottom up. People here welcome new technology. Some cultures, you have a resistance. But China's sort of almost going too far, perhaps, we can say, in terms of its embrace of technology. We never get, uh, you know, we, the WeChat is happening 24 hours a day. That's you know? right. Uh, too much. Too much. But uh, <laughs> Professor Wolf, uh, when uh, Mr. Clark was saying, well, some countries are quite reluctant. I was unintentionally looking at you at the time because, you know, think about the United States. They say, is the U.S. really lagging behind? Is China celebrating another dream that the U.S. has never reached yet? What would you say? Is that true? Or actually we should think about it in different perspectives? Well, certainly. Professor. Well, yeah, so I mean, it's a great question. I think all countries develop unequally and unevenly. I think that the Chinese have had maybe a little bit more openness to some planning, which has probably reduced the unevenness of some of the more recent periods of rapid growth. In the U.S., we unfortunately haven't had that. And we've had an unfortunate politicization of various growth things. So if we if we go to our four inventions that you wisely began our discussion with, high speed rail is certainly one in which the United States is literally a hundred years behind uh, Asian and European counterparts. And we seem to be committed to falling further behind, uh, unsatisfied with being a hundred years behind. Mm -hmm. We're now planning to see if we can go to 120, 130 years behind. Um, in terms of innovation, I think we've done pretty well here. Uh, but probably better at invention and then falling behind in the innovation strategy mm. period, which is unfortunately part of the modern American reality. And we have something right now in the U.S., which you don't have uh, to your benefit right. in China, which is a political moment in which people have decided, or some people, that the future is scary and they would like to attempt to return to the past. And mm. that's usually difficult to do and does not usually really rapidly increase the, the pace of innovation. Mm. Mr. Huang, Dr. Huang. Um, I think uh, uh, maybe all those uh, uh, innovation are not necessarily original coming from China. But as we talk about the scale matters, because we live in big data era, whoever uh, accumulate, collect a lot of data will have definitely have an advantage. I think China in, uh, in this regard is leading. But, but the question is, can China with its own population survive alone? I think we got enough of the population <laughs> to begin with. I think with so many data collected, I think China can do a lot more innovation based on the big data because maybe we're leading in terms of collecting a lot of data. Agree here. with that, really, Mr. Clark? Well, Chinese China's data is enough, enough for itself. Chinese consumers volunteer their data all the time because they would trade their privacy for convenience. They just want less hassle in their lives. And in the U.S. and elsewhere, people are a bit more aware and, and cautious. And mm. we don't have these big players like Ali and Tencent that are really so dominant. I mean, we have Facebook, Google, and others. But Ali and, and Tencent are so much more dominant in the Chinese economy than those companies are. So what US. are you exactly saying and suggesting here, Mr. Clark? But, Directly. Chinese, Chinese consumers are basically willing to let go of the old ways of doing things because they didn't really enjoy them very much. Mm. There was a lot of inefficiency in the banking system, in transportation, in shopping. All that's people are willingly surrendering uh, to these new business models, which is not always the case in the West. Mm, interesting. When we talk about, the, you know, whether it's inventions or not, we always being reminded by the so-called four ancient inventions made by China. China's long history has been marked with some key inventions. Most noticeably are gunpowder, paper making, printing, and the compass. Of course, those has been summed up by Joseph Needham, who is a British scientist who have been writing the civilization of science about China over the past decades. But one of the things, Mr. Needham, this professor had been also been raising up is actually a fact that over the past 500 years, you know, all of these four ancient inventions were done before the 500 years. Yet over the past 500 years, maybe not including the last 20 years, China has not yet come up with some disruptive innovation as it did with the so-called four ancient inventions. Mr. Clark, you're not a philosopher, a history and historian scholar, but you do have a lot of expertise 
in the new technologies. Help us to understand what have been contributing to the real strength of innovation or invention, and is the current China really in grasp of it? Or actually, it was the ancient China that is really winning all the others. Well, this is the big question of our time, and to some extent, where China well, is going. Well, it's been there for a long time. I thought you have already got your answers, <laughs> Mr. Kong. Well, no. I mean, the, the fact that China is almost coming back to where it was in the world in terms of share of GDP, but also in terms of share of innovation and invention. Yes, the Needham problem. By the way, he was a Cambridge economist. I'm London School of Economics, so we have some disagreements. Okay. But, but I think there was actually, uh, you know, those four have been identified by Francis Bacon and others as, like, the major contributors. Um, but actually... Um, it, the reasons for that are still a matter of debate. Like, why was it the imperial system in China? Was it was it other issues that were going on that China failed to continue innovation? But clearly, there was a gap that developed. Mm -hmm. But now, as you said, I think we have the scale, we have the top-down uh, willingness, mm -hmm. and increasingly, we should say we have the capital. If we're talking about these shared bikes, for example, one can question how profitable this will be for the companies <laughs> engaged. We see bikes littering the streets here, yeah. but there is a social utility. People are getting back on bikes. I've seen people learning to ride again, which I you know used to see 20 years ago, but people forgot how to ride bikes, right. and now I see it. So, you know, if you look at the total social uh, context, there are some real innovations coming now that uh, give cause, pause for excitement, I think. Mm -hmm. Professor Wolf? Yeah, so I think we would tend to think that, that one of the important areas of invention and innovation is political organization. And when you get that wrong, it can have various qualifications and it can make uh, progress difficult in some case even run in reverse and, and perhaps the the Chinese model deserves more attention than it always gets for interesting innovations perhaps starting in 1978 which have reshaped what we think of as economic development policies what we think governments working with private sectors can do and what we think of export orientation so I think what we define as the area of innovation and invention may, may need to extend beyond the simple technology of how you combine capital and labor to produce goods and services. Mm. And in that case, we've seen periods of relatively aggressive forward movement and periods of relatively aggressive backward movement in every country of the world, but right. notably including China as well. Uh, Dr. Huang, there has been argument. The reason why the last 500 years, not including what Professor Wolf just said over the past 30 years, happened is that China has been cut away from mm -hmm. the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It is a closed country. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's globalization time, and China benefited from it uh, back in the year when it joined the WTO, right? right? We Sorry. all agree with that. <clears throat> but the question is, how much will connectivity with the rest of the world still benefit China in the future? You argue China's own data is enough for China already. Are you going to still follow that line, Dr. Wang? Uh, I, I think in the... Uh, uh, it's very important for China to keep uh, connected to the outside world, not going to a closed one. Even with a, a large population, we have a big data we collect on ourselves, but still China need to connect to the world, and so they can absorb all the innovation globally. If, if we look back in history, right, as you're right, like China seems to be stalled for quite a long time, maybe over 500 years, mm. you know, until maybe recently, as recent as like China opened it, its door policy in, in late 70s. Right. From late 70s, we see China is moving very fast. I think if we continue working on this direction, keep opening up to the world, I think China is going to have a very good opportunity to go back to the innovation path. That's the other question I want to ask you, uh, Mr. Clark. That is, you know, when you have these innovation or invention, whatever you have it, you know, whatever use you want to work, use, is there's another thing, which is social management system. You think about shared bikes. Of course, everybody jump on bikes these days. That's good, but they're everywhere. The traffic is getting ever more complicated, and there's lack of management system. We all know that. So I guess there is something more than just invented mm -hmm. or innovated. You have to manage it and also make sure it is providing service 100% to the people that are supposed to benefit from it, Mr. Clark. Absolutely. It's a, it's a matter of public policy. It's um, municipal. I mean, we see some of these examples that are popping up in, in Europe, for example. Some of these Chinese bike operators are in Manchester. I think they're also in the U.S. Right. And suddenly this is confronting local municipalities who've invested, for example, in their own biking schemes, which are not connected. Suddenly this new thing comes along. So, yes, absolutely. We have to look at utility. We need access. Um, uh, for those people without smartphones, for example, mm. I mean, there are still uh, uh, people who have that. So yes, we're taking uh, this this 
this dynamic China market is suddenly boiling up a lot of questions which are having a global impact. But it's not just the Silicon Valley focus. That was, well, that's what's interesting. It's Silicon Valley is one source, China's another. That's an interesting debate. That's a very interesting phenomenon, isn't it, Dr. Huang? Yes, I, I agree. But I think the problem you, you bring that up is not necessarily like a showstopper. And it's probably, we can say, cost of doing business or mm. cost of being, you know, moving um, forward too fast, maybe. I think those issues can be addressed. Mm. But, uh, Professor Wolf, uh, based on that, are we going to see different innovation you know, centers around the world? One is Silicon Valley, which Mr. Clark just mentioned, and the other is based mainly on, on, on size and based mainly on desire to be new and to do something new, such as China. Professor Wolf, do you think that's likely to happen in the future? Yeah, we think it's already happening. So, I mean, it certainly will continue to happen. Southeast Asia, because of the rapid growth and the somewhat later adoption of the smartphone, has become a center of really kind of exciting and transformational new utilities. And let's remember that our six and a half billion people around the world live under pretty different circumstances. They earn incomes differently at different quantities mm. and qualitative periods of income earning. So they're going to need and want to interact with each other online or in the virtual world differently. And part of what's made China such a dynamic engine of innovation is that Chinese companies have figured out very well what Chinese consumers and what dynamic, fast-growing markets around the world want in ways that are sometimes very difficult or not altogether possible for an engineer sitting in San Jose, California yeah. to anticipate. But likewise, we see that spreading still further. And I think also the tier two and tier three cities in China will begin to have some interesting innovations which are different from the large, already very international, very sort of globalized cities on uh, the coast in China. So I think there's multiple tiers of this. I see. Well, gentlemen, we're running out of time, but I do want to ask a very important question before we go and brief answer from all of you. That is, when we think about, you know, whether it's ancient invention or the new invention, different words come out. One is competitiveness, the other is pride. But to you, what really matter? And it's gonna matter for the long term. Let's go to Professor Wall first, briefly. So I think pr pr pride is very important as is competitiveness. Pride gets people focused, unified, and gets them to excel and to give more than 100%. So it's essential. And obviously without competitiveness, you don't have endurance. So they're both equally essential and they're part of the alchemy of real success. Mr. Clark, do you have other words? Yeah, I think it's partnership across markets. It's not just, uh, we just talked about China, Silicon Valley, but it's the interplay also with third countries. We're seeing a lot in Southeast Asia where we see companies like Amazon and Tencent and Alibaba going up against each other, also in markets like India. So it's a global game uh, and may the best country win. All right. Dr. Wong. I think a pride itself, or only pride, is actually a dangerous thing. It could uh, force people to think closely, only look at uh, you know our of uh, the, the history and the backwards. I think we need the openness and then that is more important than pride. 